Welcome back, everybody, here to Just in the Booth, episode number three. I'm here with a very, very special guest today. I've got Marissa McBride. How are you doing today, Marissa? I'm great. How are you? I'm doing really, really good. Excited to have you on. Uh, for those of you guys who don't know in the audience, uh, Marissa does a lot of rele- great work, but it's just better to hear it from her herself. So if you want to introduce yourself a little bit about what you do and uh, so audience can can learn about you. Yeah, uh, I'm a segment producer at Up and Adams on Vandal TV, uh, the Kay Adams show. It's so much fun every day. Every day is so different. It's been such a wild experience starting at a production company, a TV network that was kind of from the ground up. I've been there for, the, I just finished my second football season. Uh, now we're in the off season trying to scrap some things together. We got some things coming up for the draft. We got some things coming up for the Kentucky Derby. Training camp tour is already in talks. The Brazil game for NFL week one. It's been so much fun. It's been such a fun ride. And before I was at FanDuel TV, I was at Fox Sports for five years. I worked on Fox NFL Sunday, the pregame show with Howie, Michael Strahan, Terry Bradshaw, all those guys. Uh, I've worked two World Cups, the Russian uh, Men's World Cup in 2018 and the Paris Women's World Cup in 2019. I've done Daytona 500s, Westminster dog shows, uh, NFC championships, you name it. I've done every weird sport sport event you could think of. And I'm originally from Philly. I went to Syracuse and now I've been out here in LA for going on seven years. That's awesome. Been a lot of, you know, well-traveled, a lot of different experiences, got to learn a whole bunch of different things. Like you said, all the different sport events you've done. That's really awesome. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's really cool. I've, I just grew up watching, you know, every big sporting event with my dad, with my grandpa, with my whole family. And I always wanted to do something like this, but I never really thought it was possible. And sometimes I have those moments just sitting back and thinking about all of the crazy events I've been to and how I was so stressed in the moment while I was there because I just had a job to do. But looking back on it and thinking, it's been a really fun, cool ride. And I wouldn't trade those experiences for the world. So, you know, now obviously working with Fandle TV and, and the Up and Adam mm-hmm. show. Just like, how much does that mean to you to be there working with the Up and Adam show and working with Kay Adams and just, you know, being able to produce a whole bunch of awesome content there? It's been great. It's it's so different than what I did at Fox NFL Sunday, which I'm grateful for because I'm glad I've got both experiences. I've got, you know, a great production company, a great TV network in Fox that has been there since before I was even born with NFL Sunday. And they are so you know, it's a well-oiled machine over there. They've got, you know, it's it's almost formulaic in a great way. Whereas in FanDuel and Up and Adams, like I said, every day is full of controlled chaos. We can go into a 6 a.m. rundown meeting and think we're talking about one thing and completely scratch it and do something else. Kay is so open to having fun and trying new things. And, you know, that's a great thing about a daily show. It's if you if you swing and miss, you just move on to the next day. Whereas Fox NFL Sunday, when we only had one day a week, we had to get it right. We had to get the news in. We had to address, you know, the Cowboys offensive struggles or whatever that may be. So I think working at FanDuel has really opened my eyes to a different way of production, a new way of production that I think in 2024 we're going to see much more of. Now we're on YouTube live and now I'm interacting with the YouTube chat every single day and all of our viewers. And it just kind of feels like production revolutionized when I went to FanDuel in just a different way with all the social media and how the world is evolving. So I'm so grateful that I've had both experiences and now, you know, I think I know what I like now and what I don't like. So it's been a really big learning opportunity for me. It's been great to work with Kay and the team. And it's just been really cool to start something from the ground up and see it evolve, even just from season one to season two. Yeah. Like you mentioned, it's kind of like some areas of like creating content and creating shows can be a little mm-hmm. bit freer than others with, you know, FanDuel TV, you kind of have a lot of free reign with it being daily. Yeah. Try a whole bunch of different things, find what works, find what doesn't, and uh, be able to produce, you know, really, really good stuff with you know, just trying out different formats. Yeah, definitely. Like I, I remember a segment that Kay and I tried to do about trading cards (laughs) 
And just because we were talking about trading cards one day and how we used to collect them. And we tried to do this funny and cute segment of like, this was a Tom Brady rookie card back then. And now here it is now. And it was just such a fail. It was a funny fail though. Looking back, I laugh about it when I think about it because I try to swing for the fences. The graphics were all over the place. We didn't have enough time. I didn't get to prep K in enough time to really understand the segment and once we were done with the segment, it went to commercial. We looked at each other and we said, never again. <laughs> we, can't, we can't do this again. So even in those moments, I think that it's like a huge learning curve. And it really reminds me of what is and isn't possible in those short stints and the short production time. So it's been such a great opportunity to just kind of create that good content. If you swing and you miss, you swing and you miss, you move on. I think that's the most important aspect in live television is forgive and forget and short-term memory you could have an absolute blow up in the d block of you know the day before and by the next day at 6 a.m you better have forgotten about it because we've got things to do and we just got to flush it out of our mind things happen like it, it's live tv the mistakes happen more than anyone would ever know and if you can't forget about it if you can't flush it out of your mind if you can't attack each day with a new fresh optimistic look then this might not be for you yeah i know i've definitely had my fair share of you know mishaps on my channel i don't know yeah. stuff but uh there's some videos that <laughs> <I'm just laughs> take on. Some, some graphics some thumbnails i'm just like you know what we're, we're not gonna do this again we're yeah. gonna <laughs> something new um this this series i just started doing the interview series not too long ago this is only episode three this idea i just kind of came up with on the fly i'm like you know what why not let's just let's just give it a yeah. shot i think it's gone really well so far especially because you can get to network with everybody that you want to and just learn and i think that's so important too like talking to different people in different positions different companies different coasts it's so important to get to know what you want to do and hearing firsthand from people and their experiences i think is the most important thing i i love networking with people even still you know, I'm, my head is always on a swivel. You always got to be looking out for the next opportunity. So I think the networking honestly never really stops. And I think this is such a great platform to do so because you get to really learn about a person, a person's job, where they came from and how they got there. And I think that's ultimately what everybody wants to know. Yeah. Just kind of get to learn, you know, the person, obviously you hear about them, you know, within the media and the work they do, but you get to know the person behind the media. Yeah. It's right. There's kind of almost separate areas in that sense where it's you just totally gotta separate the person you see on tv from the actual you know person that they are yeah absolutely especially just getting to know Kay over these two years it's it's been so great i mean i i've obviously have known about her uh before and i was really excited to sign on to the show to work with her and it's been great to just know the person behind the camera, like you're saying, and get to know her family and where she came from and why she is the way she is and her thinking patterns and what she's done before in her career that she's liked and what she hasn't liked. And just knowing how to phrase questions that are in her voice and knowing why that's her voice. I think that's like super important and is not talked about that often. But when you're working on a personality driven show, like I am with Kay, you really have to know her inside or inside and out, or your material isn't going to stick and it's not going to make sense to her. And it was something that I really had to transition to from Fox because all of our Fox products were, you know, like just football and we were getting the facts out and we were trying to do it in a creative way. But, you know, the guys are such professionals that they just want to talk ball and that's it. And it's been such a different form of journalism working on Up and Adams. But I'm so grateful that I had this opportunity because now I know both sides of it. And wherever I go in my career, I know to get to know the person and what they would want to talk about and how they would want to talk about it. Yeah, I mean, now you just kind of are well versed in every single area. So it helps moving forward. You mentioned all the different you know things you've done so far in your career. So I'm going to ask, do you have like a, a favorite moment or like a moment you realize like this is actually happening? Do you have that throughout your career so far? 
Yeah, definitely. I've I've had multiple. I think the coolest one was I worked on the team intros for uh, Super Bowl in 2020, I want to say. It was the Niners versus the Chiefs, the one in Miami. I worked on those team intros with the producer, Joel Santos. He's amazing at Fox. And it was a shoot that we worked on for maybe four months. It took forever. And it turned out so well. And while we were shooting it, we... Joel and I kind of looked at each other and we were like, this is going to be sick. But you can't really tell until you go into the edit bay, but we thought it was going to be awesome. We go into the edit bay. It's great. And The Rock was our host for those player intros. So working with him was just incredible too, because I mean, it's The Rock. Like, how could you not just be starstruck by him? He's a huge man and so beautiful. And it was just so awesome to work those intros because that was like the the early era of Mahomes and the Jimmy G led 49ers. It was it was just so crazy to be at the young at the young aspects of both of those teams who are now obviously amazing, like repeat Super Bowl as we just saw. So the cool moment for me was I got to work the sidelines for that the actual game in 2020. And I was in the stadium and I watched the crowd watch our player intros. And I could just hear the roar of the fans just explode when their teams came on the screen and them reacting to it in live time. Like I'm getting the chills just thinking about it. It was so cool to see all of our hard work on the, on the Jumbotron of the Super Bowl game and hear that roar. Like it was something I will truly, truly never forget. And it just shows that all your hard work really pays off. And it, you know, you make this, you make this stuff to entertain people. Football is meant to entertain people too. Sometimes I forget that when I'm in the moment because it's so stressful and hard, but it really is just a sport at the end of the day and people just want to be entertained. So it was really cool to see the crowd live react to something I worked so hard on and just feel that gratitude for the entertainment and the passion for their teams because I'm an insanely psychotic Eagles fan. So I get it. And if I saw the rock introducing my teams, I'd be going ballistic. So it was really cool to just feel that and see it and just hear the roar like on you. It was, it was something I'll never forget for sure. Yeah. I definitely know a thing or two about crazy Philadelphia fans. I'm a (laughs) seven. fan myself um just the process but 76ers fan i my phone background is actually just the process i got (laughs) ever since i got like my first phone in like sixth grade i put Mm -hmm. that same background and i said i'm gonna i'm gonna take it off when we win a championship so i still have the background wait wait i got a question so you started being a sixers fan in sixth grade yes what made you do that because we were terrible like buns for so long how 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 did that come about i i asked my brother what a bad team was that i could rebuild on nba 2k and he said the 76ers that's horrible so i became i built, I built them on 2k and i'm like you know what i like this team so i became a sixers fan damn it i could, been... he could have picked any other different team and he gave me a second round pain it, yeah it's been it's been tough um, it, I, you know, obviously I was born in Philly, so that's just in my blood, but you know, I was, I've been a fan since the AI days. So like, I at least have that going for me, but recently, I mean, Joel and and Tyrese Maxey are like the love of my life, but it's been tough. So I salute you. You are a tough soldier in that, uh, joining in sixth grade. That's tough. <laughs> It's it's tough though, especially I'm I'm in Cleveland, so I'm surrounded by Cavs fans, and then they win the yeah. championship in 2016. And I'm yeah. just like, hey, our year is coming up, right? And we got Reed <laughs> and Butler, and I'm I'm telling all my friends this is the mm-hmm. year. And then oh my god, should have been. It's all the different things are flooding back to me right now. That I know PTSD gives me PTSD. Kawhi yeah. Leonard mm-hmm. and Trey Young, and oh my, oh. God. I can't, I can't. I'm Don't like absolutely though. I just. <laughs> All the all the weird ways like you become fans of teams and then how like deep the fandom runs like sports fans really are the craziest in the world like there's nothing, nothing oh crazy. there's nothing like it the only the only thing that I think is crazier is European soccer fans I mean they yeah, are like they are tr- they're, they're truly ride or die yeah 
And I just respect it so much because I always say this, li- living in LA now, everybody has so many hobbies. It cracks me up. I don't know a single Philadelphian that has a hobby besides watching sports and drinking beer, I think. Because our what like you can understand, the weather's so bad most of the time that it's not like we can go hiking, go surfing, go play beach volleyball. We can't even really go outside for half the year. So all we have to do is watch sports. And that is like our pure form of happiness in, in most times, just like most East Coast teams, most mid- Midwest teams. And I think that's my only way to describe to Californians that I'm surrounded by why I'm so passionate. It's because like, that's the only thing we had to do growing up. And I do not regret it because I swear if I was not as passionate and was not raised the way that I was, I wouldn't be as successful in my career because I wouldn't care as much. And I think you have to care about the product and the sport and your team to keep going in this industry or I don't know how you would continue. It's it's really hard work. It's 24 seven. Like I was out to dinner yesterday and I had to stop talking to my friends four times to look at a Schefter notification to make sure that I was up to date with the free agency. And I gasped out loud when Keenan Allen was traded for a fourth round pick. Like in what world does that make sense? But regardless, I do think the passion is so important. And if you don't have it, or if, or if or if the passion is too much for you that it becomes personal and you can't do your work without seeing with a bird's eye view and, and clearly this is not the industry for you because you have to be insanely dedicated to keep up with this. Yeah, it's 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 like a fine line you kind of have to ride between mm-hmm. you know passionate and going a little bit overboard. <laughs> I try not to let my teams like dictate my mood. But uh, oh. it, it's tough when I'm like so close with the, especially the Cincinnati college basketball team. I, I work with them, right? I, I broadcast their games and all that. So when they have a t- tough night, I'm just, oh, oh my. I know. It, it gets rough. I know. It really does. Yeah. I mean, I, I was at the Super Bowl last year uh, with FanDuel and uh, my boss got me great tickets to the Super Bowl. And obviously the Eagles were in it. And I'm dancing to Rihanna at halftime thinking we're going to win because we were up by. 10 or 14 or whatever it was. And the third and fourth quarter happened. And I'm like, I, I have a bad feeling (laughs) and I have to work tomorrow and be (laughs) on TV. And I don't know what I'm going to do. And obviously we all know what happened. We lost the game. I still haven't watched the film. I won't. And I was walking like this, like arms crossed, not talking to a single soul for two miles because we had to get an Uber and, that situation was crazy, but I didn't talk to any of my coworkers for maybe 48 hours because I was so upset. I was so devastated. And of course, you know, did my work, got it done, did what needed to be done on TV, but it was a wrap for me. Like that was the biggest heartbreak I've ever experienced. And thank God we won one in 2017 or I would have been like inconsolable. Yeah. I remember at, at this point with the Sixers, I've kind of stopped having expectations but back, <laughs> a few years back i watched when we were in the game seven with the hawks and we lost mm-hmm. that game i went upstairs and stared at my ceiling for like a good two hours <laughs> about all the different possibilities that could have happened in the last like two uh-huh. minutes of that game and I'm, I'm just staring at the ceiling I'm like how how did that happen of all things that yeah happened, had i that know had to happen like was that was that the game that ben simmons Yep. Didn't go for the wide open dunk. The that was to game seven. Yeah. Over Trey Young. I I have full body chills thinking about it because in what world do you not just dunk that ball? Like he but I mean, as we can see, it something is something is off with him in the game of basketball. I don't know what it is. He has not played hardly any games since, it feels like. Yeah. I mean I the the Ben Simmons experience was um that was tough to watch as well. <laughs> I was, I was like the biggest Ben Simmons defender. Same, um, like, same. I'm like, he's gonna learn. He's gonna, he's gonna shoot the three. We see it. Yeah. In his height videos. We see it in preseason. Oh. He's gonna do it. And then, yeah. I'm like, all I season workouts. Yeah, I don't care if you shoot it. Just try it. Mm-hmm. And then, uh, yeah, that uh, didn't go. Remember well. that? Remember that Sixers fan in the crowd when Ben Simmons was shooting a free throw, and this fan was like. 
yeah. and then they came and I was like, you've got this, you've got this. Like, that's how tapped we are as a fan base that we're like trying to help our star player, number one pick, learn how to shoot a free throw with a correct follow through. Like, that's so bad. It's so bad. It gives um, it gives me nightmares still. I've had to like defend our fan base against all my Cavs fan friends who are like, yeah, this was the reason that Simmons couldn't learn how to shoot. That's what they say. And I said, well, then how did Tyrese Maxey go from 30% to like 44% the next year in that same fan base? It, it doesn't mm-hmm. make sense. My boy Tyrese, I he has given – he's revitalized our fan base and our team so much so. He's given so much new life to Joel. Like you can just see Joel light up when Tyrese is messing with him. And like I feel like it reminds him of his little brother. And it's just – it's so great to watch him because I really do think he is like a franchise building block for us. And he was so doubted when we drafted him. He was short. He was not highly touted. He was like, oh, he's great in college. Will he transfer to the pros? And when you look at him on the court, he's so much smaller than everybody else. He looks like, you know, a kid in junior high running with Joel Embiid. But he has blown all of us out of the water with our expectations. And he he just has such a great attitude. He's such a hard worker. And I feel like that's what we were missing on the Sixers team was grit and hard work. Like when Jimmy Butler left, I was like, Oh no, this is not good because we need somebody who's got bark and somebody who will play every single minute of every single game. And not that I think Tyrese doesn't have a bark, but I just think he's really nice. He does. He will play every single minute of every game. And I respect that about, about him immensely. Yeah, I, I remember after when Butler left, I'm like, this team's lacking in youth and, like, energy. And then we energy. drafted – we got to that draft, and I either wanted Tyrese Maxey at our pick or Tyrell mm-hmm. Terry, who didn't actually work out. But I'm up there just <laughs> like, just please start with Ty. Start with Ty, and I'm happy. <laughs> they call Maxey, and I go – and I'm watching the highlights, and I'm like, okay, he's got something. And then the, yeah. the moment where I realized, like, we have a star was that game against Denver in Philly – when everyone was out with COVID and we had like eight players. Oh, like, yeah. Players, and Maxi dropped like, I can't, what do you, was it, was it 50 that game or was that like 37? Yeah. I don't remember. It was the a point. Lot, I, really. But I remember when I, we literally like almost didn't have enough players to even yeah. suit up. Yeah. And, and Maxi went out there and started and put up a crazy stat line. I'm just like, mm-hmm. he has it. Like he Our has guy. it. guy. I love him so much. He's, he's like such, he's the bell of the ball in Philly, honestly, like, especially with Joel out, like, I feel like this team is his, which is crazy because like Tobias Harris is just, I mean, that's a whole nother conversation, but (laughs) I was hoping that he'd step up in this role, but I should have known just from years past that this, that role might not be for him, but I love him. Love him as a person. I need to get back to Philadelphia soon to see a Sixers game. I saw one in – Oh, yeah. I want to say it was 2018 the Cavs came to Philly, and we were in Philly, so we're like, let's go see a Sixers game. I think yeah. Bede was out that game, so it was a Ben Simmons versus LeBron duel. And oh, <laughs> the Sixers won, and I haven't been back to Philly since to see a game in Wells Fargo. Oh, you got to go. I need to I need to see – I've seen Maxi play live in Cleveland when he's visited, but I need to see in Philly again. Yeah, I'm glad that you – skipped out on the Doc Rivers era of oh. Sixers. That was insanely frustrating. So Nick Nurse, you know, that, that'll that be a good game to go back to. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm liking what Nick Nurse has done so far. I think he's, Me too. he's brought back some life to the team. Me too, definitely. And I, they just seem disciplined. Like, I feel like that's what we were also missing when Jimmy was gone is, you know, just – we're going to run these drills as hard as we can. So when we're in double overtime, you better not be gassed. And I just felt like we had zero discipline in the Doc Rivers era. I don't know if that was Doc. I don't know if that was the players. But now I feel like Nick Nurse has really whipped them into shape. And the ball movement is just so good that I'm really, I am really, I really am impressed with them. And I think once we get Joel back, I I'm crossing my fingers. I I don't want to make any you know predictions because they've disappointed me time and time again. But I have faith. I will say that. Yeah, I'm just hoping we stay afloat so we can avoid Boston in the first round. I just don't want. Oh Boston my god. In the first round. I, I I can't. But also, like, I, I don't have any faith in the Celtics either. They are allergic to the clutch gene. Maybe that's my Philadelphia bias. But like, 
come on, bro. You guys are so good in the regular season. You have amazing players, amazing players that have been together for so long. How can you not string together five wins, four wins, whatever you need? Like, oh my God. So I, you know, they look great. They always look great in regular season. They always look great in the first round of playoffs. And then the wheels fall off. So I'm I'm not as worried for them as I think other people are, you know? Yeah, I, I think I just they're they always just scare me in playoff series against us. Oh yeah. Don't against us, yeah. Yeah, I just I mean- <laughs> they always play they they're not clutch against any other team. And then Mm-mm. they go against us and it's like it's personal. Something on. Yeah, they no oh, man. It's personal. <laughs> uh, I'm gonna move away from from depressing Sixers talk here. Yeah. <laughs> We're going to go we're going to go to the NFL a little bit, right? Off-season time. Uh mm-hmm. you're very knowledgeable with the NFL and the bulk of my content is on the NFL draft. So I've got mm-hmm. five teams here. We're going to go over yeah. their quarterback scenario right now. They're kind of their situation, who they have, maybe options for a draft or potentially a sign and trade and just kind of kind of analyze it a little bit. Okay. Disclaimer here, this was filmed before the Justin Fields and Kenny Pickett trades. So we talked about those teams, but we didn't know about the trades yet. So just bear with us. Uh, so we're going to start with Atlanta. They kind of figured out what they want to do with Kirk Cousins. But I just want to hear your thoughts on that deal because I was not expecting Kirk to Atlanta. So here's my thing. I love Kirk Cousins as a person. I think he's an amazing stand-up guy. And I want nothing but the best for him including in football too. But I don't understand how we as a society are giving this amount of money to a guy who is coming off an Achilles injury who's, I don't even know how old he is. 30. Like 33, 34 maybe around there. Yeah. I was expecting like a one year or two year deal, maybe like a prove it deal or something while they while they figure out long term plans. I did not expect Kirk to be their long year plan or long term plan. I I was shocked by that. And I know he has all these Atlanta connections. I'm excited for him to be reunited with Raheem Morris. And he has so many weapons at his disposal in a really bad division. You got Bijan, you got Kyle Pitts, you got Drake London. Like you he has all of the tools. I'm just surprised that they went that many years, that amount of money. I don't think that's really smart for them long-term franchise-wise. I think he's got maybe two great years left in him. Great, maybe good. I think he'll do well. I think he could win the division. But that's because it's a bad division. I mean, remember, we were all watching last year being like, who is going to win this division? Does anybody even want to win? It was it was every single week somebody thought somebody some another team would win. I am happy for him. I'm happy for the Falcons. I hope it works out. But four years is just it was four years, what, a hundred mil or something? Yeah, I think over a hundred mil. I think it was yeah. absurd. It's it's crazy to me. And I, I just don't understand how we're trusting him with that age with an Achilles injury, if anybody's even like taking that into consideration, if I was a Falcons fan, I would be concerned. I would be happy initially, but would definitely be concerned that this is our long-term plan with those offensive weapons that I just mentioned with a window. I mean, you, you can't, you can't expect to win it all in that window with that old of a quarterback. I'm sorry. I, I know I hate to say it. I love Kirk as a person, but I just don't know if he's got what it takes to really push all the way to the Super Bowl. And I don't think I don't think they can afford to waste those young players. I think I don't know. I wish they went with somebody younger. I wish they went with somebody with a little more energy or just gave a one or two year deal to Kirk and see how it worked out. Almost a transition type of thing. I just don't know if they were thinking that far ahead with their young talent because they're not going to be there for forever. Yeah. I think they, I I was initially thinking, you know, maybe like two year deal and draft someone developmental Mm -hmm. in the third or fourth round. Yeah. They sign into a four year deal. I'm just like, we're not going to develop someone for four years unless you want to go like the Jordan Mm -hmm. love route. But I just, I know 
I don't know. It, it, it confused me. I don't know what Atlanta's doing, to be honest. I don't. Me not... neither. And I've been trying to like tap in with the Atlanta fan base on Twitter just to like see reactions because I don't know too many Falcons fans, but I'm seeing a mixed bag of reactions. I'm seeing, you know, people excited. Kirk O'Chain's so excited. His uh, intro press conference went great. His kids are adorable. His family has Atlanta ties. His wife is from Atlanta. I think that's all amazing, but you're right. I thought they were going to draft someone, and Kirk is such a good person to develop a young quarterback. He's an amazing person. He doesn't have an ego. He's ready to teach someone. He's been in so many, he's been in what, three or four different franchises that he can teach all of that knowledge to someone. That that's that's a perfect mentor. I couldn't think of a better one, honestly. And to feel like that's not going to happen and they're just going to ride the Kirk train as long as they can would make me concerned. It would make me concerned. Maybe I'll eat my words and he'll get further than, I don't know, the divisional championship. But I I think they'll win. I think they'll win the division. But I mean, it's not, it, it wasn't looking good last year. So I don't think it'll be that hard to win that division with those weapons. So let's see what he can do past that is my thing. Yeah. I mean, only time's going to tell what that yeah. really means. I think, like you said, they can win a division, maybe make the playoffs, but I don't think they go much farther. Mm-mm. Which is a shame because I love Bijan. I love Kyle Pitts. If he gets used correctly, Lord, um, Drake London, they've got they've got a great young defense, great young defense with Jesse Bates and everybody. And I just – and they have Zach Robinson, which, you know, is like a McVay disciple, a Kevin O'Connell, you know, lookalike. It's it, – he'll have a great fit and familiarity in this offense, but how how far does familiarity and young weapons push you when you're the one dishing the ball? And it's up to you to keep this team afloat. That's that's my main concern. Yeah, I I am not sold on the move. I, I just think <laughs> I think it was I think there was better options to sign maybe a one year guy and then go to the draft next year. Maybe even yeah. like the Fields trade could have been interesting. I'm <sighs> I'm not sold on a, on a four year Kirk Cousins deal. It, I don't think that was the best move they they had. Uh, they had other options. What if I can bring this up? What is going on with Justin Fields? I have what? no idea. That was actually one of the teams I was gonna. I was like, <laughs> well, like, because obviously all signs are kind of pointing to Caleb Williams at this point. So, like, uh-huh. what are they gonna do with Fields? Or you're not gonna get much value back at this point. So, yeah. Well, I I think that's honestly the problem. There's been reports that the trade market for Justin Fields is abysmal, and I don't think they were expecting that. And I don't know why they weren't expecting that because they've, in my opinion, the Bears have set him up for disaster since day yeah. one. They have not built anything around him. Their front office is a disaster. Their their coaches have just not utilized him in any way, shape, or form. And I, I honestly feel bad for him because I feel like they really just kind of ruined the beginning of his career. And so I'm hoping for a bounce back for Justin Fields. Whether... That's in Chicago, which I'm honestly thinking he might stay because they're bu- they're building a good team now. They got Keenan Allen, they've got Cole Komet, they've got they've got multiple pieces that I was like, okay, I can see where they're going. If they give Justin Fields another chance and he does flourish, that's great. That would make me so happy for him. But if I'm if I'm Justin Fields, why would I want to stay there? when they've done me this dirty. But then you look on the flip side of the coin. And if you're Caleb Williams, why would you want to go to the Bears after what they did to Justin Fields? I mean, they their front office and their choices have been better, you know, this past year, this offseason. Is that enough trust? Is that enough evidence to make a number one pick want to go there? Because I don't know. I'm a big history girl. I'm a big precedent girl. Fool me once, shame on me. Fool me twice, shame on you. I I just wouldn't I wouldn't be confident in going there. And we actually had Devin Hester on the Up and Adams show two or three days ago. And we asked him, Justin Fields or Caleb Williams, and he said he would stick with Justin Fields. 
and he wants to give him another chance and build around him. And Caleb Williams actually liked that tweet that we put out. And first of all, we were shocked. We were like, oh, <laughs> we don't want to mad at us. We're not trying to start any beef for any smoke. But I can't tell if this was a big discussion in our production meetings on our show with Deshaun Jackson. Is that like from Caleb Williams, is that him keeping receipts and wanting to prove everybody wrong if he does go to the Bears and does well? Is he petty like that? Is he motivated like that? Or is he agreeing and saying, hey, I don't want to go to the Bears. Like, I don't want to, I don't want to deal with that BS. I don't want to deal with that crapshoot. So we're not sure yet. And obviously only time will tell. But if I'm a Bears fan, I'm split. I I just I just would have no confidence in my front office to make the right choice. Sincerely. Sure. All right. Back now. Sorry, we had a few audio difficulties, but we're back now. <laughs> Talking about Justin Fields and Caleb Williams. I think you had talked about Williams liking the tweet that you guys have sent out about Fields. Um, potentially, you know, kind of what does he think about that? Is he is he yeah want to go to Chicago? Does he not want to go to Chicago? I think I, I was I was saying it's kind of hard to read Williams because he's not like I, I don't know, he does yeah. some stuff with the media that you can't really read what he wants, what he what is it actually wants to do. It's kind of I, I don't know, but I feel like if you're the Bears at least. I'm probably going to take Williams if you're the Bears because you don't get the number one pick that often. That's just not something that you get. And you kind of have to take yeah. that opportunity, especially when we've seen Fields hasn't been great, but also you haven't done anything to help him. So, like, it's just it, they just put mm-hmm. themselves in such a lose-lose situation. I know. And I feel like they somehow always do this. So I don't even feel bad for them. But – one thing on that is that we had Paige Demakos on our on our show as well, and she's just like the draft guru. She's so smart. Very much recommend checking her stuff out. She was saying the same thing you were as, you know, when you get this number one pick and you have this caliber of talent in Caleb Williams, it would be unbelievably dumb to pass up on him and watch him be a phenom somewhere else. And, you know, obviously only time can tell. People could be bust, busts as we've seen or not develop into what we thought they were going to be. But if you have this chance, it is really hard to convince a franchise to not take a shot. And I do agree with you that it's really hard to read, Caleb. There was also this report from The Athletic's Jeff Howe. Is Caleb a little bit too much of a distraction for NFL teams? He's so media trained. He's made so much money with NIL already. He's going to all of these Hollywood parties. He's at the white, he's at Michael Rubin's white party. He didn't come to the combine, but somehow he didn't play at the combine, but was there to support. There's just these little things that people are a little skeptical of him person wise, but it also could just be people are just judging him and just being haters for no reason. So it's going to be really interesting to see play out. My final take on it is I just don't trust the Bears so much with Justin Fields already that I would that I would take Caleb because I, I can't trust them to even put Caleb in a better situation, even though that's what they're trying to do right now. Something just about the two, Justin Fields and the Bears, is not mixing. And I hope for him to have a way better career somewhere else. But like you and I have just talked about, the market isn't looking good. And his returns aren't looking good. I really, really wished that he went to Atlanta. It'll be interesting to see if maybe he ends up in Minnesota. I mean, Sam Darnold cannot be it when you have Justin Jefferson on the team. I, it, he can't be the answer. I, I'm i sorry to say, Sammy D, but you're just not it when it comes to a Justin Jefferson-type caliber player. You, He can't be the main reason – or he can't be the main focal point of that offense when you have somebody of that talent. And I think they they either need to do something big in the draft or they need to figure it out quick because that extension is not signed by JJ. The trade rumors are flying. I know he loved Kirk Cousins. So it's a really sticky situation there. And there's got to be a better option than Sam Darnold. There has to be. 
Yeah, I mean, this is why this is why I like fell in love with the draft season. I do a lot of my stuff on the on the channel about the draft, mock drafts, and scouting. I spend way too much time scouting random prospects. <laughs> um, but I just it's just this is smokescreen season. Uh, this is <laughs> smokescreen season. People are like, oh, you know, the the Commanders want to take Daniels over May, and then there's like the Giants want JJ yeah. McCarthy today. I saw that report. She's like, there's. I saw random stuff coming out and then half of it ends up just not being true because it's just random smoke screens but i, I know the vikings case um they just made the trade today to get the texans first round pick and i, I told them up immediately i'm like this immediately smells like a trade up for a quarterback because now you have yeah. two first round picks you can go to a team like the chargers maybe who need talent they could get those two first round picks you move up to five and get jj mccarthy or if by mm-hmm. chance Daniels falls past both the commanders and the Patriots, you just get a quarter. Yeah. Because I don't, D- Darnold's not the answer. And you sign up for only one year too. So they're looking to draft somebody definitely. Yeah. And I hope that whoever they draft keeps Justin happy because if Justin is not impressed, if Justin doesn't want feel like being in a rebuild era or feel like being with, a first year quarterback who might need a few years to really polish it up. I don't blame him because he's having great season after season and it's just not pushing past, just like we were talking about with the Falcons, just not pushing past what we expect out of somebody like Justin. And I don't blame him if he wants to go somewhere. I really don't. And it sucks for Vikings fans to hear that. It sucks to watch them go through agony in this offseason, not knowing if he's going to be with the team, not knowing what their quarterback situation is or anything. You know, I feel like they're shedding players left and right. But, uh, and they also, they they just got Aaron Jones too, right? So Mm -hmm. they, they have pieces. It's just, who's going to be your, who's going to be the captain? Who's going to be, who's going to be the commander? It, it's tough because I don't I don't blame I don't blame JJ if he doesn't want to be with a four, first year quarterback. I really don't. You could have, you know, like a CJ Stroud type season and just blow all expectations and really ball out, but I feel like those are few and far between. Yeah, I saw the whole, you know, Justin Jefferson to the Bengals rumors were flying around the day Cousins went to Atlanta. Mm-hmm. I don't really see that happening. I don't the Bengals don't have enough money to pay their already you know, players on their team that I don't yeah. really are gonna have the money to pay Jeff if you were to get traded there. But like I, I think if, if you're the Vikings, you're trying to keep uh Jefferson Haffey. Obviously you're gonna need a yeah. draft quarterback this offseason. I I've given them McCarthy in past mock drafts at like uh mm-hmm. I think you pick at eleven maybe. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it's very likely they trade up into that top five and take him there just because I mean quarterbacks have value the quarterbacks go high i say that every single time yeah yeah they just even if they're not like graded to go that high they're just going oh yeah every time premier position just just happened like that i i mccarthy was one of the first guys i scouted this cycle and i had him at like mm-hmm. a, a i think an early third round grade which is fine for quarterback Th- those guys go in the first mm-hmm. I, I just think mccarthy needs to sit a year and when yeah. you play darnold for that one year that makes me think okay they think the same way if mccarthy's really who they're targeting they set it up well. They did. They did. I agree with that. But if you're if you're Justin Jefferson, are you like, I'm gonna, sorry, Sam Darnold, I'm gonna suffer through a year of Sam Darnold because he's so up and down and sideways and backwards. You never know what Sam Darnold you're getting. Am I gonna suffer through a year of Sam Darnold just to wait for JJ? And what if JJ doesn't pan out until like year three or year four? If you're if you're Justin Jefferson, are you are you waiting around for that? Is it even his choice? I, I don't know. There's like a lot of, like you said, a lot of smoke screens, a lot of he said she said, a lot of drama this off season already. I, this is one of like my favorite off seasons so far, and it's only a week into it. I think that they got to figure that out kind of quickly, and I wish that they had somebody more athletic and has more of an upside like I even think that Trey Lance to Minnesota would be really cool I think he's super athletic I think he was not he was also not given a fair shake by the Niners the Cowboys hardly used him I think he's just sitting there I think 
that that's a type of person that JJ would be like, you know what? At least I haven't seen what he really can do. And if I'm practicing with him in the off season and I'm gaining confidence, like that's enough for me where I feel like with Sam Darnold, we've seen the best of Sam Darnold. Yeah. And I don't know if that's good enough for Justin Jefferson. Yeah. I think, I think Jefferson ultimately is probably going to end up getting like the kind of the same route T Higgins is at where you don't sign an extension and you yeah. end up franchise tagged and then requesting a trade. Uh, or if they don't trade you, you just hit free agency and he's going to get a massive, I mean, record setting yeah. deal. He's going to reset the wide receiver market. And between him and Chase, the, the wide receiver market is going to explode soon. Yeah. Yeah. Depending on what the it on- feels. Yeah. The only reason I could see the Bengals trade actually working is that I feel like JJ Jamar and Joe want to play together so badly that. I wonder if any of them would be open to team friendly deals and restructuring just to potentially get, get a Super Bowl or potentially knock off the chiefs to even get to the Super Bowl. I do. I do wonder that. I know that takes a lot of financials and a lot of math that I am not equipped to handle, but, and I know everybody, every player should get their bag. Like I am, I am so in favor of that. I just wonder what those three players I just named, I wonder what their um, priorities are and if they do want to go for it and really, because I mean, who's stopping that offense? Who is stopping that offense if that if that happens? And, you know, then T's got to go somewhere. And I think you'd get a good return for him, not anything like JJ, but I don't know. I don't know who's stopping that. So we'll see. We'll see. Yeah, I think if anyone were to probably restructure, it would be Burrow to get yeah. you know, his college wide receivers both on the same team. I just the Bengals are so handicapped with money already that they they'd have to work some some front office magic. Money. Yeah, they need Howie Roseman. I mean, <laughs> Howie Roseman does insane stuff. I don't I don't know, I don't know how to do it. every offseason Eagles are doing stuff like they're doing something. New. I know. I don't know how I- they're doing it. I'm convinced he is either a magician or he's part of the mafia or something because he has something over all of these GMs that he just gets what he wants and he structures the cap in such an interesting way. But yeah, it's, it's going to hit us eventually, but with this window, and that's what I keep talking about. When you have this window with these players, you better make it work fast. And if you don't have a good plan in place, like how he does all the time, like you will waste players. And that's how I feel with, with JJ and Minnesota. I I'm, I'm sick for him. It's it, it pisses me off for him. So I hope they do something to at least alleviate that. If he does stay there. Yeah. I, I, I hope for Jefferson's sake, he finds himself in a, in a good situation, whether it's staying yeah. in or getting out somewhere. I think, Another team that I had on here, which is kind of comparable to where Jefferson's at, is Devontae Adams and the Raiders. Because Adams yeah. is approaching, I mean, he's getting up there in age. He's in his 30s, I think, mm-hmm. or early 30s, maybe 29 years old. He's up there, and he wants to win. Yeah. And your quarterbacks are Aiden O'Connell, who was okay. Mm-hmm. He was fine. And yeah. you find Minshew, who is, yeah. again, okay, he's fine. But are either of those guys your future? Probably not. No. I don't think so. And I'm a huge Gardner girl. I love him. His brief stint with the Eagles, he revitalized the Colts last year. He's such an energy guy. He's so funny. He's great. But he's not a guy. Like I'm saying with Kirk, I don't I don't think they're the guys to bring these players to what they deserve. And maybe if the schemes fit really well and you can pull a little Brock Purdy situation. Sorry, but when schemes work and you have great players, sometimes that does work and you can be mid and you can, you can be okay. I don't know if, I don't think, I don't think either Aiden or Gardner are are those quarterbacks for the Raiders. I don't really know what they're doing. They are so confusing to me. I'm really glad they hired AP. I'm so happy about that, but I don't know what they're doing. And I don't know if they even it seems like they don't even want to win or want to try that hard. And 
it's so confusing to me when you have great talent like Max Crosby and you used to have Josh Jacobs and you got a new coach that the players respect. I mean, like, where is Jimmy G in this situation? Where is Ryan Tannehill? I feel like he's missing an action. Not that I think either of them are fabulous either, but they bring they bring experience. They they're solid. They can teach a young quarterback. Where are those two? Yeah, I think the the Raiders are in and I, I haven't had them taking a quarterback this year's draft. I just don't think. I mean, unless you want to really reach up the board for like Knicks or Penix in the first round, I don't think that's viable. Yeah. So they might wait till next year. The guys like Quinn Ewers, I mean Shadur Sanders. Mm-hmm. I'm a big fan of Cam Ward, but he probably won't be a first round pick. I think as dumb as this might sound, I, I want to see them trade for Zach Wilson. Because oh my God. <laughs> I think if you're going to be bad anyways, and you're deciding between <laughs> Aiden O'Connell and Wilson, Wilson at least has the higher upside out of the two. Yes. It's not a bad, I mean, you're not going to give up much. I mean, for Wilson, he's, he's going to cost you like a sixth round pick at most maybe. So yeah. it, it's not a horrible idea. It's not a good idea, but it's yeah. not the worst idea. What about what about Justin Fields? To the I could see that. I could yeah. see. That. He, I mean, I he would fit the offense. They just they they don't have a run game after losing Jacobs, but I know. But I do believe in the running back position that you can get someone who's a second string, third string, and like you said, if the scheme works, it works. I. I, I tr- it's going to be hard to go from Josh Jacobs to literally anybody. It, it is what it is. But I do, I mean, I feel like I could speak to this from an Eagles perspective. Like we had DeAndre Swift. He was obviously amazing. We didn't utilize him correctly. We have Boston Scott, a giant killer. He's great for those short gains. Rashad Penny hardly played. I mean, I don't even know where he was. And we had Kenny Gainwell, who was great when we needed him. We always had him in the red zone. Running back by committee, I think works. And if you have, you know, four, three, two guys that you can depend on, and they're not going to be stars, but if they can get four yards each carry, you know, a third down, a third down pass, if they can swing out in the backfield, I think that would at least help a team that's rebuilding right now. And I think there's a lot of running backs that would want a shot at that. I think the Raiders will probably end up drafting one, probably like you second think. or third round. You could go for somebody. I mean, this guy yeah. like Braylon Allen from Wisconsin is really, really good. Kind of slept on. Yeah. Uh, Jonathan Brooks from Texas coming off the injury. He was insane. Mm-hmm. He's probably running back one in this. It, it's a weak running back class, but he's probably RB one. Yeah. I mean, it, but there's guys down the board every year who get drafted. Every year. Even like Tajay Spears. Yeah. I mean, Tajay Spears is really good. Thinking mm-hmm. like I mean, Kareem Hunt a few years back for the Chiefs was a third round guy. Yeah, there's Brown, so many. Jerome Ford who who filled in for Nick Chubb just fine. They got Ford in like mm-hmm. the fifth a few years back. It's just you yeah. find everywhere. Yeah, Elijah Mitchell. I I think I heard this morning is on the trade market. So you, you just have you just have players like that that are just kind of floating around looking for a home. And like you're saying, like running backs in the draft always crack me up because you could have a fifth round guy who ends up being a star and it really just depends i mean as we all know like your o line's so important and if you if you can make a hole i could i could be a star running back for the raiders if if i get the right holes you know what i mean so it just it just depends and i really if i was a raiders fan i'm just i'm just really rooting for them in to get ap a good first year as a real head coach And I just want them to make, I want them to make legitimate franchise moves. And I feel like I haven't seen that from them in a long, long time. Yeah. I think the last like real big time move they did was Devontae Adams. And that didn't really Mm -hmm. fully work out in their favor because Derek Carr ended up leaving. So, and Carr also just wasn't the guy. I mean, that was just Mm -hmm. never going to work, but never. Yeah, the I, I I'm kind of tired of the Raiders making small time moves. Do something, yeah, big. At least try. I mean, it it can't yeah. hurt at this point to to try to do something with what you have. Exactly. I mean, you got it. You got to try. And they have that new stadium. The fan base is split geographically, and I feel like every every game at that stadium looks like a home game for the other team. 
And I mean, I'm sure that's tough. I'm sure living in Vegas is tough. I'm sure that front office and the ownership is tough if you're a quarterback looking to go somewhere. But I, I just get so frustrated for these fans when teams don't make any legitimate moves. And I, I would just be like, what's the point? What are we doing? Sell the team at this point. If if you can't make this work, like let's get it together and let's actually try to win. I know their division's tough. It is what it is, but everybody, anybody can make a bounce back. Look at the Texans last year. I mean, they were, they were awful for so many years and I'm I'm fully on the Texans train. I think they're great. I think D'Amico's amazing. CJ Stroud, Nico Collins, Tank Dell, like you and with all of their offseason moves, like there's there's a legit contending team there. Anything is possible if you put in the effort. Why don't these teams make the effort? It, it's mind boggling to me. I think the Texans are gonna end up being like the new model that teams try to follow. Because yeah. I mean, we've seen it a few years, like everyone did the Josh Allen model where you give him a few mm-hmm. years and then you get that star receiver and like Stefan Diggs and he plays really good. And so the Eagles mm-hmm. did that with Hertz. They got AJ Brown. The Titans tried to do that. Uh, I mean, they, they got D hop. Yeah. Levis. I, I don't know about that. The bears tried to do that. Like <laughs> DJ Moore for uh, Justin Fields and, and yeah. the teams tried to follow that model and it oh barely worked. I mean, it worked for the Eagles. It worked for the bills. Anyone yeah. else? It definitely didn't. So I feel like the yeah. Texans, the uh, teams might start to try to follow what they did. And I'm yeah. just not sure it's it's a model you can follow considering they got, I mean, it, it, there's luck involved. They they got lucky so much with, luck. Like the timeline that fell to them. And I, I don't think it's something that's going to be able to be replicated. Absolutely. I think that luck really, and the t- luck and the timeline really played into it. But also, you got to commend them for believing in CJ Stroud and believing in all their rookies with all the CJ Stroud, he failed the test mumbo jumbo BS. Like I just, I'm so happy for him that he proved everybody wrong and was like, I am not a test taker. I'm a football player. I'm going to ball out, watch this. And just the energy of him and D'Amico combined, like literally revitalized that entire fan base, that city, that franchise. So sometimes you got to stick to your guns and sometimes you got to really go with a decision and go all in and try to make it work. I wish the bears did that with Justin Fields. I wish they tried to really put pieces around him and really believe in him and uplift him just like they did with CJ Stroud and the Texans. But some people just, they, some franchises just don't got it like that. And I'm super happy for the Texans. I think I I hope teams follow that mantra and try to uplift and surround their important players with important pieces. I think that's just is what it is. I'm sure there's reasons why they didn't do that, but for that many years with Justin Fields, it's just inexcusable to me. Yeah, I think I, I was definitely a fan of Houston last year. They were really fun to watch, mm-hmm. except for when they beat the Browns in the playoffs, but that's another story. <laughs> um but kind of kind of speaking of the Browns, right? Their interdivision rival is kind of the last team I had on my list. The Steelers are all over the place. Is oh it, my God. Is it going to be Kenny Pickett? Is it Mason Rudolph? Is it now Russell Wilson on a $1 million deal? I, what is even yeah. going on in Pittsburgh? Here's my thing. I think it's Russell Wilson, no question. And this is why. Kenny Pickett lost the starting job last year. I don't, I feel like people don't remember that, that he literally got benched last year for Mason Rudolph and or Mitch Trubisky or who, whoever it was at the time. It was Mason Rudolph, right? Yeah, I think it was Rudolph. Yeah. He got benched last year. If you're in, in my perspective, if you get benched and then you have someone of Russell Wilson's caliber, think of him what you may. I think it's no question. I think Russell Wilson starts. I think Mike Tomlin respects Russell as a player and wants to give him his due. Arthur Smith and Russell Wilson. I hope that works out. I have no idea, but I just, the Kenny Pickett, Mason Rudolph, all of those quarterbacks that to me are just so mid. I I just, I think you tried their experiment with them last year. I don't think it worked out. And I think if you bench your starting quarterback in the regular season, when you're trying for a playoff push, 
I don't think it's looking good for next year unless you improve dramatically in the off season, which I haven't heard anything, you know, and it's not like Wilson was any bad last year either. I mean, he wasn't spectacular, yeah. good season. I mean, there's nothing wrong with, I know what he did. I felt like Denver yeah. gave up on him just, I mean, just cause they wanted to not pay him the contract, but he was fine. I mean, he played good. Absolutely. And then he had good Steelers, stats last year. Yeah. I mean, and then the Steelers, you're looking at them pick it through six touchdowns and upward of like 10 starts. That's just not acceptable. And then Rudolph no. played fine, but that's just it. You can't really get away with fine. Yeah. If if you want to continue Mike Tomlin's, what, 17 season stretch of a not losing season, I would not go with either of them. I would go with Russell. And I do think Denver gave up on him. And honestly, I can't believe I'm saying this and standing up for him, but I'm so sick of the Russell Wilson slander when it comes to this Denver situation. I just think that they gave up on him entirely. They treated him like garbage. They just didn't want to, they didn't want him to succeed. And I think that is incredibly stupid when you have someone like Russell Wilson that has so much potential. Talk about his personality, talk about his leadership, whatever. But I want nothing more than Russell Wilson to tear it up with the Steelers in whatever capacity that looks like just to give a big middle finger to the Denver Broncos. And I hope I hope they eat all that dead cap space and they pay all that money and they regret it because I thought the contract in the beginning was stupid. I think dealing him right now is stupid. And I hope they feel that because what a disaster. <laughs> yeah, I think for for Denver, they're kind of most likely scenario. You're not going to stick with Jared Sidham. There's absolutely no way they do that. If, if they do that, yeah. I, it's just, oh my gosh. I think they're they're <laughs> most likely going to end up taking either Knicks or Penix with their first round pick. Uh-huh. Maybe a yeah. trade back scenario into like the later part of the first, you can still get them there. But they need a quarterback, and you don't want yeah. to take a chance that either of those guys are going to fall to you in the second round. If you have a heavy preference of one of those two, you got to take them in the first. Which you're, those those guys are good. Are are they first round mm-hmm. guys? I'm not 100 percent sure. They're both up there in age and, and aren't like yeah world's best prospects. So if you're banking your future on one of those two in a potential reach spot in the first round, I just, I don't get the decision-making and I, I like, mm-hmm. Sean I, I, I loved him when he was in new Orleans. I'm, I, I called him mm-hmm. a cute whisper. He went five and zero with Teddy Bridgewater and made Taysom yeah. into like a competent quarterback. He, goes <laughs> he loves Denver, Taysom. And it's like, he lost all his touch. I, I just, I don't get the decisions that he's, he's making over there. I think there's personal beef between Sean Payton and Russell Wilson. And I think egos got in the way. And I think all communication and all teamwork just fell to the wayside. I mean, the Broncos are also shedding players left and right. I, I don't know if they're looking for a whole rebuild, if they're starting from scratch, it feels like. But I don't think Russell, I don't think Sean Payton can afford that. I mean, he's getting up there in age. He's getting up there in teams that are willing to deal with him and his situation. I mean, they had good pieces and they're fleeing the coop. So I don't really know what they're doing either. It's frustrating for me to watch from the outside, from what they started with, you know, a few years ago to where they are now. I think they got to learn from this mistake, honestly, and really take a look in the mirror and, and, do you want to win and how do you want to do this? And is Sean Payton, the guy you you gotta, you gotta think about that when it comes to all, yeah, you gotta think about that when it comes to all these decisions and all of these ego problems, like, is he the guy is, is this going to work out? Because I think the bad moments have outshined the good moments in Sean Payton's tenure in Denver. It just is what it is. Yeah, the, the Saints got a first round pick for Sean Payton. And I know I mean, it's not like the Saints are doing amazing in the coaching department, but they they all no. they'll take the first round pick, and Denver's not doing any better than they are any day. Exactly, and so and now like you see Saints players fighting to stay with that organization. You see Demario Davis. You see you see Cam. You see I hope Michael Thomas stays with them. You see people wanting to stay within that organization because that organization treats them well coaches aside they they have a coaching issue as well but nothing 
no ego problem as to the extent of Denver. It's frustrating to the players so willing and almost sprinting out of the door in Denver. So I don't really know how you fix that. I think it starts from the top down. And I don't know if that means Sean or the front office, but they got to figure it out fast. Yeah. I mean, I, it's, it's interesting to get to see. We're just about running out of time here, but the last thing I want to ask you, what has been your favorite move of the off season so far? Can I be biased? You can be as biased. I know you're going to. You can be as biased. <laughs> I mean, okay, biased Marissa loves Saquon to the Eagles. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's just like delicious to take him from the Giants. It's scrumptious. It's music to my ears. I just love that we have somehow gotten better in the running back department. I loved DeAndre Swift last year. I, I thought he was amazing. I don't think we used him enough. And to go from DeAndre to someone of Saquon's level, you know, Penn State guy, super ready to play with us. Interdivision trade. It's just tasty to me. I'm really excited. I think he brings a lot of swagger to an already swag-filled offense. Um, really excited to see how he looks in our scheme, specifically with Kellen Moore. I think Kellen will use him very well because I didn't have a lot of confidence in that trade if – Helen wasn't there because I just think we, I just think we blew it with DeAndre. I do. I do. The non-biased Marissa. I think I like, let's see. I think I, I can't, I mean, I think I like Kirk to the Falcons, not the, not the years, but I think I like the move in general. I'm happy that he got to where he wanted to go. I'm happy that he's surrounded by offensive weapons and in a bad division. I'm happy he's with a familiar scheme and coaches that all came from the same tree. I think that's great for him. Like I said, I want to see him in year one and year two. I can't speak to year three or year four, but I think year one and year two will look good for both the Falcons and Kirk in this situation. Yeah, I mean, this offseason has already been insane. There's still a lot more to come, and especially draft day. There's going to be trades that go down on draft day and before draft day. It could get mm-hmm. even more wild than it already is. Yeah, for sure. I'm I'm really excited. It's only been one week, legal one week of the offseason, mm-hmm. and it's been so fun to cover it. And I feel like I'm staring at my phone 24-7 these past couple days just because things are flying off the trades. I'm really excited, and I think this draft is going to make things even better, and it's going to be a really fun offseason. Yeah, if you guys in the audience want to be able to keep up with this NFL offseason as it gets crazy, please be sure to go check out FanDuel TV. Check out more more of what Marissa does. It's great work over there. You guys do some incredible stuff. Uh, As always, it was was a pleasure having you on the show. Great to actually get to talk to you and uh, hear the insight for the NFL. Yeah, thank you so much for having me on. This was was so fun, and I love to just get to – you know, share my unfiltered opinions, biased or not, uh, and just kind of discuss this off season. Cause I think a lot of people, you know, tune out during this part of the season. And I think selfishly, this is one of my most favorite times. So thanks for having me on. Of course. It's a pleasure having you on. You guys, like I said, go check that out and I'll see you all in the next video. Mm-hmm.